Joining us tonight to talk about your health are Stephanie Bug, a colon cancer survivor, and Dr. Rebecca Brown, Director of Colorectal Surgery at the University of Maryland Medical Center, also an Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you both for being here, Stephanie. Thank you, Thank you in particular, and let's start with your story. This all began about a year ago. So it was Christmas Day of 2023, um, I had just been having, I've been feeling off for about three to four days, um, just having some changes in my bowel, um, how my bowel was working, and having just a little bit of cramping in my stomach, and I just felt off. I felt enough different that I felt like I needed to go get checked out, so I went to emergency room. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, yeah. And, and when they look at you in the ER um, at your age, they're, they're not thinking colon cancer, right? No, actually, originally they suspected that I, uh, it was my appendix. So they decided to do a CT with contrast. And that's when they saw that it was not my appendix, that I actually had some kind of um, blockage of some sort in my, uh, in my colon. So. And that required surgery ultimately and chemotherapy, and that's all behind you now. It is. It is. I finished chemotherapy just about a month ago. Terrific. Yes. And this was your doctor. Yes. Yes. Dr. One Brown was one, one of my them. one of them. Yes, my yes. surgeon. Yes. Um, your surgical patients typically older than Stephanie. Typically well, what's a typical than age Stephanie. for colon cancer? I mean, we start screening for colon cancer now at 45, so most of our patients are typically in 60s to 70s um, when they're diagnosed with colon cancer, but we are seeing an alarming rate of increased colon cancers in younger patients, even younger than 45. And the, the overall trend towards um, uh, cancers in, in younger patients isn't just colon cancer, right? cancer, there have been multiple cancers that have been shown in a recent study to have increasing incidence in younger patients. Is there a theory for this? I mean, Stephanie is extremely healthy. You ran marathons, right? I have, I have, yes. I ran a few. Very active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what could it be? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that we as a medical community have a definite answer for that. Um, if you look at colon cancer in general, there are genetic risk factors and there's also lifestyle risk factors. And so we're probably seeing a shift in both of those. Um, it would be unlikely that all of these new cancers in young patients are related to some sort of genetic predisposition alone. Um, so probably there's something in our lifestyle, diet, exercise, consumption that, that is leading this. We just haven't quite pinpointed that yet. I mean, knowing all this, and you're a young person, do you do anything differently? Should, <laughs> should people watching do anything differently? Uh, I mean, I think if you look at how to decrease your risk for developing colorectal cancer, um, there are a few lifestyle modifications that can be made. There's no way to prevent colon cancer just with lifestyle modifications, but living a healthy life, eating high fiber diet, avoiding red and processed meats are some of the things that we think can help decrease the risk of colon cancer. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question, about colon cancer or uh, the increase in incidence in cancers in young people, send us an email. The address will be on the screen, livequestions at mpt.org. You mentioned screening for this. And, and that has, has changed in, in recent years. Yep, so 45 is the new 50. Um, colonoscopy screening is recommended to start across the board for every person in the United States at age 45 instead of 50. Now that, that's not somebody with, with family history or some of the other risk factors. Correct, would would yep. that move it up? Yeah, so family history um, is very important to know for talking about colon cancer screening. If you have a family history of colon cancer, it's typically recommended that you start your screening 10 years before the diagnosis of colon cancer in your family member. So, for example, Stephanie was diagnosed at age 41. Her children need to start their colon cancer screening at age 31. Um, which, wow. and, and if you have a family history of colon cancer, you don't qualify to do the um, Cologuard or the other uh, non-invasive screenings. Um, so they will get colonoscopies when they're 31. But Stephanie, you didn't have family history, or at least nobody close, right? No, I had an aunt who passed away from colon cancer, but other than that, we did not have any significant cancer in our family at all. Um, no significant history, so. 
What, what are the screening options? We've talked about colonoscopies, mm -hmm. and everybody out there has heard about colonoscopies, and, and maybe not in a favorable way, so we should talk about that. And, and you talked about the Cologuard mm -hmm. thing. Um, pros and cons of those approaches, and is there anything else? Yeah, there there is another study that looks for fecal occult blood, um, sort of similar to the Cologuard test. Those studies are are um, screening studies that look in your stool for abnormalities that could indicate that you have colon cancer. It doesn't um, diagnose or prevent or remove any pre-malignant lesions like polyps. So we know that most colon cancers grow from polyps from the time that you have abnormal cells in your colon to when it turns into colon cancer, we think is about 10 to 15 years. Um, so in colonoscopy, we not only can diagnose any cancers that are there, but we also remove any polyps that are there, and that is actually preventative against colon cancer. So to do a colonoscopy, which you do, you've got to get the patient to basically clean things out. Uh, which means drinking some stuff you wouldn't ordinarily want to drink. You will never want to drink it again. But is that getting better? Are there improvements in the prep? We definitely have some different preps that are much easier to take um, in pill form or lower volume than historically uh, we have used for patients. Viewer wants to know if there's a new uh, blood test for colon cancer. I've read there's something under development. We are fastly looking towards liquid biopsies as a screening or a method for cancers and colon cancer, but there is not a blood test as of yet. Let's talk about treatment. Um, you perform surgery and um, talk about the evolution of that. You do minimally invasive when you can. I do, yes, absolutely. I think the minimally invasive surgery means we use laparoscopy or robotic surgery. Um, it's usually a combination of small incisions about the size of my thumbnail and one slightly bigger incision that we use to take the specimen out, um, which is different than the um, traditional up and down incision through the middle of the belly. Um, the the oncologic operation is the same. So the surgery that we do on the inside is all the same, but the recovery and the cosmetic appearance afterwards is, is much improved. It's so rare when we talk to a surgeon that we get to have a patient here. How, how was it? How did, we, uh, how did they do on the, uh, you know, all the inpatient stuff and the aftercare? I had a wonderful experience. I was fortunately a good candidate for a robotic surgery. Um, so we did robotic surgery. So I only had six incisions, just as Dr. Brown said. And, and not big incisions, a little. Uh, yep, yeah. I mean about about that size. I was in the hospital for about three days. Uh, they took very good care of me, the nurses, the staff, everybody. Uh, then I went home, and I was actually at the oncologist's office within two and a half weeks, talking about starting chemo. I was up and moving around. Um, so I had a pretty good recovery, better than I expected it to be from such a major surgery, so. Um, viewer question, this is from Wayne, and I think I know Wayne, and if I, I know the correct Wayne, thank you for watching. Could microplastics be a factor? So we're talking about things that, I mean, particularly for colon cancer, and we, and we read about these things getting in the water supply, toothpaste or, or whatever, I mean, is it theoretically possible that some little irritant going through your GI tract could trigger something. I mean, absolutely. I think that those are the things that we need to start of s sort of start looking more into. We talk about environmental factors can also play play a role in this, and I think we just don't we had just haven't identified those specific risk factors yet. The whole thing with the the biome, the microbiome, the the uh, crazy amount of bacteria that lives inside all of us. Mm -hmm. There's like some hints that there could be something there. I, yeah, I think, again, you're hitting on all of the research that we're working on currently to try and see if there are other modifiable factors that, that we can look at to prevent um, colon cancer. Viewer wants to know, is there an age where the risk of colonoscopy is higher than not having one? The typical teaching is that um, once you hit 75, um, if you have a normal colonoscopy, you likely do not need another one. Um, but I think now that we are seeing a lot more longevity in patients, that, that that decision should ultimately be made on a patient by patient basis because there are some 85 year olds out there who, um, who would benefit from having another colonoscopy and, and potentially some polyps removed and, and those sorts of things. So. Stephanie, what would you say your message is to 
younger people out there who um, maybe it's not even colon cancer. Maybe they had a suspicious bump on their back or something in terms of um, taking the initiative and getting checked out. I think there's a couple things. I think first and foremost, I think become very familiar with your body. Um, don't hesitate and put things off to go get checked out. I also think it's important to make sure that you have a team of practitioners, whatever, whoever they might be, that will listen, that will advocate for you, um, and just advocate for yourself. Because when people are so young, I think sometimes we tend to put it off and say, oh, I'll just go get it checked in, but life happens, kids stuff happens, work happens, everything, and things just can keep getting put off, put off, put off, put off. And I just think it's important just to act when you feel that something might not quite be right and just advocate for yourself. We, we've talked to so many people over the years doing these segments with so many you know, varied conditions where it seems like overreacting is actually a good thing. You know, if somebody is feeling something weird with their heart or something, don't, don't wait till tomorrow. Would, would you back that up? Yeah, I think, you know, the signs of colon cancer can be, early colon cancers can be very subtle. And so I think it is very important for patients um, to notice these changes that they're having. Blood in their bowel movements, changes in their, you know, stool, stooling habits, um, fatigue can even be one of the signs of colon cancer. And so really, you know, noticing those things and seeking care and, and really advocating for yourself if these symptoms persist is important. Other risk factors, there's a link w between inflammatory bowel disease and colon cancer. Yes, absolutely. Um, so chronic inflammation of the colon likely leads to increased risk of, of colon cancer or does lead to increased risk of colon cancer. Um, so our inflammatory bowel disease patients are a, a different population. They have, once they're diagnosed, have much more frequent colonoscopies and screenings and much more aggressive management of any colon abnormalities that they have. Any other takeaways you'd, you'd want our viewers, particularly young viewers, to, to know about with respect to colon cancer and some of the other conditions that we've talked about where we're seeing an increase in this population? I mean, I think, again, it's just important to listen to your body. As Stephanie said, she felt that there was something off with her, and she, that's what caused her to, to seek care, and I think that that's the most important thing in the beginning. And every time you take the bold step of, of talking to people, whether it's on TV or in person, somebody tells you they're gonna go get checked out and that's wonderful. It's true, it's true. Yeah, once I was ready to share my story and I felt comfortable after I'd processed the entire journey that I'd been on, um, I did, I, I, I want, and I'm open to people talking to me about it, asking me questions, asking people about my journey, obviously no medical advice, but um, just, well, having people be comfortable to talk about it. We'll leave general. it there. Stephanie Bug, thanks so much. Thank Dr. You. Brown, we appreciate your time as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.